Good morning, church. It is Sunday morning, so time to talk about the Word of God for just a little while. Um, we have one of those scheduling things that makes things a little rough this time of year. As you know, my custom is on the Sunday before Halloween to, um, or the Sunday closest to Halloween, to preach a Halloween sermon, and then the next Sunday do an All Saints Day sermon, which is the first day of November. Uh, this year we ran into one of those situations where either I could do the Halloween sermon really early and then do the All Saints Day sermon uh, today, but rather what we're doing just for the sake of schedule, since we never do the Halloween sermon on Halloween or the All Saints Day sermon on All Saints Day, we're going to do the Halloween sermon today and we will do the um, All Saints Day sermon next Sunday. thought about trying to combine them into one, but decided not to do that. So today what I want to do is I want to, um, in the Halloween sermon, continue talking about, just for a few minutes, this notion of the politics of Jesus. And we've been talking about this for some time, and we're going to talk about it just a little bit more as we head towards Advent, because I think it's super important that we embody the politics of Jesus. And remember, politics is just a way of talking about being neighbors. Uh, we Americans tend to have one version of doing that, but Jesus brings a different version. And so for the Halloween sermon, just a short reflection on a text you're familiar with. Uh, I want to go ahead and I'll just read it first. This is in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 13. Jesus says, and this is the Sermon on the Mount, uh, kind of the bedrock of his politic. He said, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how will it become salty again? It's good for nothing except to be thrown away and trampled under God's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on top of a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on top of a lampstand, and it shines on all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so they can see the good things you do and praise your Father who is in heaven. Over the years, I've kind of um, started to think about this as uh, sort of the paradigmatic uh, verse for understanding the politic of Jesus. We've talked about a lot of particular things when it comes to politics about laying our power down, the notion of kenosis, self-emptying, uh, taking up the way of the cross and love. But if you wanted to summarize what all of that means, what all of that looks like in a, a, a different sort of way than we normally do it, we might say that Jesus does it here at the end of this text. You are to let your light shine in such a way that people see through you the Father and give glory to him. And I love the way he says this, and we've talked about it before. He says that we uh, should do what the Common English Bible says, our good works before people. But really the word there, uh, while it can mean good, also means, and I think perhaps even even better here means beautiful works. That is that at the end of the day, the politic of Jesus is about living our life in such a way that people see who God is and are drawn into his way of doing business, which offers, as we've been talking about, a radically different way of being humanity, a radically different way of doing business than what we have been doing in the world for these past thousands of of years. This is what Jesus is doing in the world. And so he uses this metaphor, you are light in the darkness. And that's what I want to reflect on a little bit today because there is a binary here. And we could press this binary, any metaphor, um, too far, but I think that it's helpful to frame what we're trying to do. Because in the you are the light of the world text, there is very definitely an us and a them. There is uh, on the one hand, those who are sitting at Jesus' feet, literally, if you're in the text, or figuratively, as we sit around his feet this morning, we are ostensibly the ones who are committed to the way of Jesus. We are here to follow him. We have pledged allegiance to him. This is what we did when we were baptized. This is what we did when we gathered at the communion table a few minutes ago. And then there is um, those who aren't, pledged to Jesus. And so there is um, a place, I think, for pronouns like we and they and us and them. 
And even in a world without sin, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, let's assume that Genesis chapter 3 never happened. There would still be, in some sense and in some ways, pronouns like us and them and we and they. Just from the fact that we would have been fulfilling the command God gave us in Genesis 1.28 to go into all the world, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Life in Alaska is, by its very nature, going to be different and give rise to a different kind of life than life in Tennessee, than life in Jamaica, than life in Africa, than life in Asia. The problem we've talked about before it's not that we have pronouns like we and they or us and them. The problem is that in a world dominated by fear and accusation and power rooted in the reality of death ushered in by sin, is that what we have done with those pronouns is we have set we against they. We have set us against them. But what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 is that there is this sense in which there is a we, those who are following Jesus, and there is a they, those who are not following Jesus. But our primary relationship to they is us for them. Specifically, he says, you are to act as if you are light in the middle of the darkness. You are to act as if, um, act in such a way that your beautiful deeds are seen by those who are not pledged to Jesus, and they come to glorify the Father through your actions. And so I think one of the fruitful things we can do, and this is not original to me, I've heard it from a variety of people over the years, it's kind of worked its way into my thinking from a variety of people. I first heard it with uh, Lee Camp in his book, Mere Discipleship. I think there is some fruit to thinking about who our primary we is. And that is, as we engage texts like Matthew chapter 5, we are the light of the world. Um, who do we mean when we say we? And so there's this exercise that we could go through. Um, we um, live in a world where there are a variety of problems. There, there are po poverty and uh, there are widows and orphans to kind of use biblical frameworks. There are those who are oppressed, those who are at the bottom of the pile. We're overrun with things like violence and addiction, and corruption, and that list could go on and on and on. We could talk about racism, we could talk about sexism, and patriarchy, and all sorts of things could fit into this category of our broken world. Um, when we think about addressing those issues, that is to say, when we say, we need to do something about that, who do we mean by we? Who is our primary we? So when we say we need to address poverty or we need to bring peace to the world or we need to uh, address corruption or we need to do something about violence, I think in our popular imagination, most of the time what we mean by that is we mean either our nation or our political party or something along those lines. But we could argue, Jesus is, is hinting at this here, and this is what Jesus is affecting in the world. If you go back and you kind of trace out the breadth and the width and the depth and height of what Jesus is doing, that God sent Jesus into the world to address those things. And he established his church, us, to do those things. And perhaps we would be better suited when we think about we. What should we do about poverty? What should we do about violence? What should we do about racism? What should we do about corruption? That the better place to start is not with a government or a political party or whatever the case may be there, but to start with the church. That is, in the politic of Jesus, our primary starting place ought to be, our primary we ought to be the people of God. Living out embodying, working through, pursuing the agenda of Jesus in the world, the platform of Jesus, rather than that of any particular nation or particular political party or any particular school of ideology or philosophy. And so the we changes things. For starters, one of the things that we've already mentioned that it changes is that it brings clearly into focus this dynamic of we for them, us for them. Because what we want to do most of the time in the world is we want to define who we are and then we want to set everyone who is not a part of who we are against us. But again, in the New Testament, 
the dynamic is not that there is no we in them in some sense, in other senses that is true, but that those of us who follow Christ are here as a blessing for those who are not in Christ. We've not been brought into the world to condemn the world or to look at the world with our arms crossed and a stern look on our face and say, you all are all going to hell. Don't you know it's going to burn? The gospel message is not that everything is going to hell in a handbasket. The gospel message is that we embody with our lives, not just our words, that God loves the world enough that he's not giving up on it. That he is determined to reconcile it, to redeem it, to restore it. That is who we are. We for them. But even more importantly than that, even more fundamentally, and this is where uh, this notion of lightness and darkness comes in that Jesus is using in Matthew chapter 5. Um, when we start thinking in terms of kingdom first, what, encur what it encourages us to do is to rather than, let me just set that down, uh, rather than pondering how wrong the world is, we start to imagine how we might embody a better world. And so what we like to do in the world is we like to create monsters. As a matter of fact, this whole Halloween sermon thing for me got started years and years ago when I read a series of blog posts by Richard Beck, who is a um, uh, the chair of the psychology department at Abilene Christian, he talked about the theology of monsters and how monsters were created as metaphors or escape mechanisms for the things that are wrong in the world. We like to create monsters and then we pretend if we could only just get rid of the monsters, then everything would be good in the world. And so our monsters are, are socialists or, or capitalists or Republicans or, or Democrats or the LGBTQ community or the fundamentalist Christian community. The monsters vary depending on where you stand. But if we could just get rid of them, then if we could just fix them, then things would be okay. But when you think about lightness and darkness, you notice that the role of light in the world is not to condemn the dark or what you might see as dark because we need a little humility there. We might be wrong. But the role of light in the midst of dark is to be something different than the dark. In other words, light doesn't have to advertise itself. Hey, we're over here. We're over here. Light does not have to uh, draw attention to itself by pointing out that there's darkness over there. Light in a dark room draws attention to itself by the virtue of its very existence as something different. And so how might things change if we went, begin to seriously consider what it looks like to live as light in the midst of a dark world? For us to consider that our primary job as we blessing them is not to condemn them, to create monsters and destroy them or critique them or point out 95 ways that they're wrong, but for us to embody an alternative that they will find attractive, beautiful deeds before people so that they will come to glorify the Father. Let me give you a few examples in the few minutes that we have left. Um... We had a conversation when I was in South Texas. I know this would be shocking that we talked about things like immigration living on the Mexican border, but we had a conversation about what it would change to make the kingdom of God our primary we in some very practical situations. We, we talked about language. One of the things that you find when you live in South Texas, a lot of people speak Spanish. Some people don't speak any English. And that old sentiment that you will hear every now and then, that this is our country and you ought to speak our language, um or go home comes up quite a bit. And we discussed how that was primarily seen we uh, from a national perspective, a certain sort of national perspective. And, and what might change if we took that notion of learning English, but we applied it from a kingdom perspective instead? How might it change if we went to our Spanish speaking sisters and brothers and neighbors and instead of saying, you're in my home now and you're going to speak my language, what would it mean for us to say, for instance, um, it will make your life a lot easier to earn a living, 
to get the things you need to be a blessing to your family if you know how to speak the language of your neighbors. And so can we teach you that as a way of blessing you? And since we are interested in being your neighbor, will you teach us Spanish as well? That's just one example. Another example might be, this is a historical example, and this is a bit of historical fiction. One can dream about how things might have gone, perhaps should have gone. Um, most of us grew up in the South, and we have, of course, the heritage of the Jim Crow South, and Jim Crow is um, a dark period in our history. But during the Jim Crow South, one of the sad realities is that, uh, statistically speaking, by uh, population, the two largest groups in the South, religiously speaking, were the Churches of Christ and the Southern Baptist. And so often we look at the situation and we say, you know, we've got this we-them situation, and them oftentimes is like, you know, the government. We need to get them to fix it. They're the problem. We need to change the laws. We need to change the system. We need to put new people in Washington. Washington is the problem. And oftentimes we kind of apply that logic to Jim Crow. But do you realize that if we, those who claim to follow Jesus, had simply said, we're not going to live by the standards of Jim Crow. That that system could not have stood no matter what the law said. If all of those restaurant owners and diner owners who were Christian had simply said, um, anyone can eat in my restaurant, and all of those who went to church with them in a community said, and we're going to patronize your restaurant so you don't go out of business because of the backlash, Jim Crow never would have stood. And I wonder how many times we create monsters and we say fixing that monster is the solution when uh, just a little bit of imagination could show that we could make a difference instead. Uh, my cousin posted something on Facebook a few weeks ago that I was thinking about. And this is kind of the last example I'll give you. I just want to kind of jog your imagination. He was talking about, he used to be a social worker. He was talking about the number of kids in the foster system in the United States. <clears throat> and one of the hurdles to adopting being the high cost of adopting. And he pointed out that if uh, it would only take um, X number of dollars, and it was a big sum of money, but it was an imaginable sum of money, it would only take X number of dollars to completely finance the adoption of every child in the foster system in the United States. It was a big problem, but it was a doable problem. And it was interesting. I, I thought it was a good post, but in the comments... Uh, people almost immediately started saying, that's right, the government should stop funding Planned Parenthood and do this instead, instead. And they offered a variety of solutions in which the government did something different. And I wonder what would change if we thought first, instead of they need to change their budget because they're the problem that needs fixing, they're the monster. What would it change if we said, perhaps first, how might the church, not any particular congregation, but the churches across America, what might change if the church changed its budget to say that these lives are important? And so here's my admonition to you. Um, I'm almost out of time, so I've got to go uh, quickly here before my file runs out. Think kingdom first. And the primary move of the kingdom is not to condemn the darkness, but to do our beautiful deeds as light before the darkness in such a way that people see our beautiful deeds and give glory to the Father. Stop creating monsters. Start embodying the kingdom. Okay, let's pray. Father, please help us to be light in the midst of darkness. Give us the imagination and the courage to do so. And we come and we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Church, I'm out of time. The camera's going to shut off. We love you.